Hello, book lovers, and welcome to the 117th episode of Authors Love Bookstores from a Mighty Blaze. I'm your host, Joe Moldover, and I'm so happy to be here with you today. Every week, I travel across North America and beyond with my partner, Kimberly Hensel Lawrence, to visit independent bookstores and the authors who love them. And today, we are visiting Buttonwood Books and Toys in Cahasset, Massachusetts, with author Lynn Reeves Griffin and bookseller Katie Baxter. Lynn and Katie, welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Lynn Reeves Griffin is a nationally recognized expert on relationships and family life, writing as Lynn Reeves. Her novel of domestic suspense, The Dangers of an Ordinary Night, was described by the New York Times as a sensitive examination of a dysfunctional family and a full of secrets community that claims to be seeking the truth. Her brand new novel, Dark Rivers Across, <laughs> just published yesterday, November 8th, 2022. Lynn is also the author of the acclaimed novel or novels, Girl Sent Away, Sea Escape, and Life Without Summer. She's written nonfiction, Let's Talk About It, Adolescent Mental Health and Negotiation Generation, Take Back Your Parental Authority. Lynn has taught family studies at both the undergraduate and the graduate levels, and she teaches writing at Grub Street. Uh, she's also a developmental editor for writers of fiction and nonfiction. So Lynn, that is a quite a bio, and uh, congratulations on Dark Rivers to Cross. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, we want to talk about all these things. We want to talk about the nonfiction. We want to talk about the fiction. We want to talk about your mental health hat. We want to talk about writing thrillers. Uh, so much to get to. But the first thing we want to talk about is Buttonwood. So we are here with Buttonwood Books today because you chose them as your beloved independent bookstore. Tell us why. What is special about Buttonwood? Well, I know Katie will agree with me. Uh, it's all about community at Buttonwood. Uh, they have been a, a central part of my life for many, many years. I first began going to Buttonwood when it was a tiny little store in a plaza next to a sweet little store called Sea and Cheese. And I used to go over and pick up my dinner and I'd stop in at the store and bring my children in there for story time and all of that. And I became enamored with the bookseller, Betsy Detweiler, who uh, has just been an amazing champion of my work all the way back to when I published my first parenting book. And then I told her all about my dreams of turning to writing fiction. And she's really just been there every step of the way. And then uh, her daughter-in-law, Kathy Detweiler, who now manages the store, and really everyone who's ever worked there. So I'm beyond grateful for their partnership and their side-by-side -side, uh, coming along with me on this crazy journey. That's fantastic. I love that. Uh, to the audience, to those of you watching with us live and also people who watch this recording in the future, we want to remind you, we are here to support independent booksellers. And if you would like to pick up a copy of Dark Rivers to Cross um, or any of Lynn's many other works, we are dropping links in the chat for you to pick them up from one place and one place alone. And that is Buttonwood. You can purchase it online and um, definitely encourage you to do that. Um, Katie, uh, welcome to the show. We're so happy to be here with you. Um, I wonder if you would just tell us a little bit about your experience at Bud and Wood and what's going on in the world of independent book selling right now. Certainly. I love that Lynn mentioned Betsy Detweiler's um, love of the bookstore. She was the founder, the original owner, and I had the pleasure of coming into independent book selling thanks to Betsy. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciated all of the commitment to community that Betsy brought to her vision of the store. And now being there with Kathy Detweiler and her team, and I've shared with them that that real innate sense of community root continues to flourish and grow. It, it's truly part of the identity of Buttonwood Books and Toys in Cohasset. And the, the, the root system just extends across the community, which means as a bookseller, and with the team there, we have a breadth of knowledge of our readers, their tastes, where they want to explore, what they love is their comfy favorite. So that's that's what we do at Buttonwood. We're just always connecting with our readers and with the creativity of the community. 
Absolutely. And I want to talk about that. We want to talk about audience, we want to talk about books. And I think we should start off with this brand new book, Dr. Dark Rivers Repressed. Uh, Lynn, for people in the audience who are not yet familiar, give us the elevator pitch. What's this book all about? Sure. Well, like, uh, like all of my other work, Dark Rivers to Cross is a family story. And it explores, in this particular case, a woman who you know right from the beginning of the story is on the run, and you don't know why. You also know that her identity is strongly rooted in being a mother. She has two adult sons, and she's crafted a life for them in the wilderness of Maine, the northern woods. And really what the journey is, is to figure out why are the dark secrets keeping the mother and her sons distant? While at the same time, you're in for a traditional domestic suspense novel where the boys decide that they need to figure out what she's keeping from them. And there is a, a propulsive ride for that answer. Mm, yeah. You know, it's, you know I, I think that um, one thing I think about when I sort of look over your entire kind of catalog of work is that it does seem like you come back to this issue of family again and again. And it just kind of strikes me that this is something that seems to preoccupy you but that you you sort of seem driven to look at it through all these different lenses. So, I mean, Dark Rivers to Cross is sort of the lens of sort of like a thriller. You've also written um, other novels, uh, published as Lynn Griffin, um, which I guess are sort of would be thought of as more sort of family um, family novels or family centered novels. You've done nonfiction about this. I think you also do teaching about this. I think you do clinical work about this. I mean, first of all, what, two part question. What is it that just keeps you coming back to this issue? To this issue of family and keeps you stuck on trying to understand and express things about family. And secondly, why do you keep on sort of taking off your glasses and putting on other glasses and looking at it from the, all these different angles? I mean, what can, can you give us some insight? Sure. Well, I feel like it's your clinical psychology background that would ask such a question, but I don't mind being vulnerable. So I will tell you that when I was a teenager, I was 15 when my dad died and we had had really kind of an idyllic family. Our parents were clearly very in love. They were very connected with one another. There were four of us in the, as, as children. And um, when he passed away really unexpectedly, uh, it created such turbulence in our family life. And it has taken perhaps the rest of all of our lives to figure out exactly what happened and why we were all so derailed so, so enormously. Um, so I find family fascinating, both from a personal point of view and also because in the work that I do, I'm constantly hearing family stories that are similar. Themes like, we're not telling each other the things we're most afraid of. We're not talking about the things that make us our most, most authentic selves. We're afraid to tell people how much we might be struggling and we put on a face for what it is we think we're, we're doing and how we're living and that changes our relationships. So I do keep going back to it but with every book, I try to tackle a different social issue that will unveil those cracks, that will look at what the answers could possibly be for healing. Uh, and in this particular story, I take on inherited trauma. I take on witness to violence in families. I take on adoption. Uh, because again, these are issues that once again will reveal what a family is really made of. Mm. That's really interesting. That's really well said. Um, you know, Katie, something that strikes me about this novel in particular, and I think Lynn kind of captures it in her, you know, sort of her quote elevator pitch, mm -hmm. is that this is a um, exciting, you know, sort of like propulsive thriller, um, but it's also something that has a tremendous amount of depth. I mean, as we've been saying, I think it's about, you know, it's about trauma. Um, it's about, um, you know, it's about family. It's about grief. Do you find that unusual to sort of have a book that is, you know, a quote genre book that's like a thriller or something like that, that really has these types of dimensions to it? And and how do you convey that to people when you're selling this book? I mean, how do you how do you how do you get that across? I love that question. And I would say, uh, first of all, Lynn, thank you for thinking of Buttonwood and also for writing this work particularly coming out of a dark period of a global pandemic where so many of us in our communities and neighborhoods were concerned about what was happening in families if we couldn't reach them and see them. And so I think, Joe, to answer your question, um, 
very often a reader categorizes their taste. They self-categorize. I love thrillers. Um, I love historical fiction. Don't give me anything else. <laughs> and so that's the fun of getting into deeper conversations with the readers. And if I were to find out that the historical fiction lover um, loves nature, naturalism, I would then easily make a connection to this book um, and, and really say, you know, if you want to understand um, a real local setting, because here we are, South Shore, our South Shore folks go up to Maine. I can easily link um, aspects of a genre, the mystery, the thriller, the, the angst, the personal fear um, to something that interests that reader. So I don't think the genre has to be limiting when it comes to getting readers to pick up this book. Um, and I love that what Lynn is doing is she is letting the children have real prominent roles in this book for, for adults. I mean, they, they are really self-exploring and understanding where they fit in a story that they don't understand or know. And I think many of our readers will be hooked by that. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, Lynn, as you as you toggle between genres, as you go from sort of like family focused fiction to, to thrillers, what does that do to you as a writer? I mean, do you find it to be confining in a way? Do you find it to be liberating to get into sort of like the thriller car and be able to drive that? I mean, what what is it like to kind of throw that switch or, or is it not something you really think about? Do you just write what you want to write and then it kind of like occurs to you, oh, I, this is a thriller. I mean, how, how does it work? I think it occurred to me over time, and now I'm really loving the, I feel like it's a real sweet spot for me. Uh, but when I began writing, people actually characterized my first novel, Life Without Summer, as a mystery. And I never saw it as a mystery. Mm -hmm. Yes, the mother in that story needs to figure out what happened to her child, but I never thought of that as a mystery. And other people categorized it for me. Uh, and then by the time I got to Girl Sent Away and The Dangers of an Ordinary Night, I was writing still about families and the social issues that preoccupied me, but the stakes were higher and the tension was higher and the conflict more unsettling. And I really think that has to do because of the world we're living in right now. Mm. I'm feeling like the stakes are higher. I'm feeling like everything is more tense and anxiety producing. And it's revealing itself in the stories that my characters are wanting to also tell. Uh, so I feel like it became domestic suspense or thriller by virtue of the things I'm wanting to examine. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Um, I mean, Katie, it, it is the case that we're living in sort of unsettled times. Um, you know, A Mighty Blaze and Authors Love Bookstores evolved in response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, we are sitting here today, a day after yet another election. Um, I mean, there's there's just a lot going on. And I think that sort of all of us have this feeling of not being able to get comfortable. Um, what do you think that does to book buying tastes? I mean, you know, I remember, er, you know, early in the pandemic when we were doing this show, people talked about, oh, you know, everybody just sort of wants like, you know, like cookbooks and cozy books or maybe like classic, you know, everybody's going to read Moby Dick now. But I mean, you know, <laughs> you know here, although I didn't. Uh, but, you, know, I mean, you should. <laughs> I, I should. I should. I know. Um, but like, you know, but like, here we are. I mean, what do you think the nature of this world does to 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 people's tastes? What what do people need in books? I think because we were isolated and recognized that we crave being able to discuss books. I'm going to say, and I'll tell you why. I think we've come out some of us as braver readers. Mm -hmm. And I say that based on Buttonwood Books and Toys book group discussion last week, or November 3rd, of Our Missing Hearts mm. by Celeste Ning. Yeah. Because um, that, is a that is a difficult book to read. It is beautifully written, but it tackles the themes of family separation. 
of impact, of authoritative decisions on very personal aspects of lives. And to come together in person and talk was actually, I think, comforting to people. And, um, and also it was a shared experience that, oh, loved the book, but it was, it's, it's painful to read. And I would say with Lynn's story, I mean, re that first that first chapter, if you're a survivor of trauma and you're still working through it, you, you get the chills. And then you also feel the strength of resilience because thankfully there's a whole book to go. That's not the end of the book. It's the beginning right. of the book. And so that's why I've really been looking at bravery, the, the courage of reading. Yeah, if that's that really yeah. <laughs> that's really interesting. That's a really interesting answer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I would completely agree. I would say the bravery question is so important because I really believe that fiction is a vehicle for us to examine things from a safer distance because it isn't actually happening to us. It's vicarious. It's a story. We can close the book when we need a break. We can open it once again when we're drawn to it. But what fiction allows us to do and what I hope my work allows us to do is to talk about the things that we otherwise find very difficult to pull out of thin air and talk about because the story provides the frame for the discussion. Uh, and we don't have to examine our own lives if we're not yet ready. We can talk all about the characters and the choices that they've made. You know, that's, I mean, that's a great comment. And it actually sort of anticipates my next question, which was I wanted to talk to you about the relationship between being a mental health professional mm -hmm. and being a fiction writer. And um, I think that's something that we both share. Uh, and um, I believe that like me, you were first a mental health professional and then started writing fiction. Is that correct? That is right. Yes. So um, I, I, I mean, I would love to hear anything you think about the interaction between those two roles. Um, and I and I guess in particular, I will ask, um, what did moving into the world of fiction give you that you were not finding as a clinical practitioner, a teacher? a writer of nonfiction, sort of what did you find stepping into the world of fiction? Well, it's really funny. I, I talked about this a lot when The Dangers of an Ordinary Night came out, which is that my original background in high school and college and beyond was that I was an actress and I was really interested in theater. And I would have always told you that I was a storyteller, even as a kid, I might have been accused of telling a story or two. And um, so I've always been drawn to that. But then I went a sort of predictable route in my professional career. I went into nursing and then I went into school and family counseling and worked in those fields for many years. But what I wasn't getting, what I was getting from that practice was stories. People speak in story. They come in and they say, I have to tell you what happened. And, and they just, they exude story. So that was familiar and, 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 and made sense to me. But what I wasn't getting and why I turned to writing fiction was the creative part of my life was under-examined. I didn't have the ability to disappear inside a story without any responsibility for it. As a, as a clinical person, as a counselor, I often feel that I'm responsible for really active listening and thoughtful insight and anticipatory support, right? But with fiction, I get to just disappear and I don't have to solve anything. And I try very, very hard to write fiction that is not nonfiction in disguise. I'm not trying to achieve anything. I'm just looking. I'm just observing. I don't think my stories have clean cut answers. I think my characters are often deeply flawed and they are trying to figure it out the best that they can. And, yeah. and I feel like that lack of prescriptive advice is is great because I don't think there are any one size fit all answers. Mm, that's right. Yeah, and I oftentimes think that people who who come in uh, looking for counseling or sort of looking for psychological help are oftentimes kind of looking for somebody to help them to make sense of a story. You know, they're sort of like coming in with sort of story parts, but it's not quite making sense, and they're looking for help building a sort of a coherent narrative that they can live with. 
uh, you know, telling a story that they can live with. It doesn't hurt them. And so I sort of feel like the process of clinical work has something in common with with storytelling. I wonder, I mean, in particular, you're, you're a developmental editor um, as well as a writer. And I wonder sort of whether doing that work with writers can sometimes almost feel like the clinical work you do as a counselor. <laughs> yes, it often does, because I think like you, whether it's someone who seeks therapy or someone who's trying to write something, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, there is some story they are trying to make sense of, right? Whether it's a contrived one or whether it's their own. Um, it's also about the stories we tell ourselves that might be in error. I think what I really try to do in Dark Rivers to Cross is look at the story that Lena is telling is not really the full story. And she comes to believe that it's the story over time when in fact it isn't. And it's only her adult sons that reveal to her that maybe the story she's telling isn't fully true, right? Maybe parts of it are better, maybe parts of it are worse, but it isn't uh, It isn't the only story. And right. and keeping it to herself is creating, is creating distance. Mm. Uh, so I do, I think it's all tied together. I, I feel that that story is so universal. It is the way we chat with each other. You know, yesterday I went voting. You're not going to believe what happened. It's like we speak in story. We connect through story. And it's just a wonderful place to spend time. That's right. Yeah. And we tell ourselves stories. I mean, all the time, all the time. Um, you know, Katie, one, um, you know, we'd said before we've been doing this show for almost three years. It's our episode 117. One one show I sort of keep on meaning to do, and I, I never quite get around to putting together, but one of these days I will, is I, I want to do a panel of um, of authors with interesting day jobs. And I sort of, I want to talk, I want to put together authors who are sort of for publishing fiction, but in their day jobs are, you know, are counselors or like corporate attorneys or are, you know, like surgeons or side, whatever. I, I think it's so interesting when people are bringing together these two strands of, you know, of a profession or a science or whatever, and, um, uh, and, and sort of creating fiction. And I mean, that's a sort of a general observation, but I wonder whether you as a, as a bookseller have any thoughts about that, about these sort of, you know, hybrid authors and kind of, you know, what, what they bring to the table. Oh, sure. I, and I think booksellers who might have second lives yeah. Uh, yeah. really are on the lookout for those kinds of authors. Um, I think it's it's so interesting, right, when we have um, retired FBI folks or right. current um, detectives who come who come out with titles about the Gardner Stewart heist. You know, and you get their angle, um, their lens, if you will, or you have mm. people in the political world who are also authors. So I think for me, um, the story, and, and as we often hear the expression, great literature, it's, it's a lamp or a mirror for life and what we're experiencing. And to know some of the backstory of authors but then to be fair to the creative spirit and the creative gift of those authors um, to, to recognize that they can delve deep into a theme, into a conflict, into character, because their life is enriched by the work they do yeah. and yeah. the people they meet. And so I think that type of a panel would be great fun. Um, I'll do it. I'll do it one day. I'll, I'll pull it together. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I can give some suggestions. <laughs> oh, I, will, I will reach out to you. I will reach out to you about it. Yeah, that's been on my to-do list for a long, long time. Um, Lynn, I want to talk to you about uh, setting as well. This novel takes place it's set in Maine. Um, Maine is one of my favorite places. And uh, you set this along the Penobscot River. Uh, tell us, um, I, I just want to ask you just first of all, just about Maine and sort of, and, and, and what the setting has meant for you. And also just in general, sort of what setting does to shape the, the writing of the novel. Did you know from the beginning where this was going to be set and, and, and sort of how did that shape the, the story? You know, setting is super important to me. And I learned that through, uh, you know, my second novel where, I really did create a house that was a character, 
right? And I and I set out to, to figure out how to take something inanimate and and make it come alive. And so setting has always since that time become really central to me. But where Dark Rivers to Cross takes on setting is like a whole other level uh, because it really becomes the backdrop for which we explore nature and nurture. What parts of our behavior and our way of living in the world are related to our biology, you know, where we come from, who our parents are, and what is shaped by where we live and how we have to interact with that environment. And so I knew that when I wanted to explore that, that setting had to play a huge role and that it would be a major obstacle, or at least at the very least, remote and wild and untamable, and that that would affect some of the characters more than others. One character is immersed in it, loves it, and feels at home, and one character in particular does not. And so that creates a lot of conflict, which of course you need conflict for a thriller. So, so all of that worked to my advantage. Um, Maine itself is in my backyard, I feel like. New England is one of those places where you can hop in the car and be in a, in a completely different landscape in a short period of time. And we uh, go to Maine every summer for a week with our adult children still join us. And it's a, it's a very special place. Uh, and so I knew I wanted to set it there and I thought the more rugged, the better. So the more North I went. Love it. That's mm -hmm. fabulous. That's fabulous. Yeah, we, we visited Maine earlier this year with uh, Greg Brown for The Lowering Days, which is also set in the Penobscot region, wonderful novel. And uh, I just, I it's, it's such a fabulous setting. It really is a setting that becomes a character in the novel um, in and of itself. Definitely. Um, and that is great. Uh, I want to remind the audience, uh, Dark Rivers Across, you can pick up a copy from Buttonwood Books Online, or if you are lucky enough to live within striking distance, Lynn is going to be at Buttonwood Books in conversation with Marjan Kamali uh, tomorrow. Am I getting that right? Yes, I'm very excited. Marjan is a marvelous writer. She's the author of Together Tea and The Stationery Shop. Really beautiful books. Uh, she's a thoughtful woman, and I just am delighted that we're going to be chatting about books and how fiction has the power to change us. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm delighted that in-person events are happening again. And, uh, you know, um, and I, I, I went to one uh, uh, last night. Um, Mighty Blaze's co-founder, Jenna Bloom, had an uh, in-person launch for the paperback of her memoir, Wonder Oh, Audio. great. And uh, uh, wonderful. And it was just so good to be sort of back with, you know, back in a crowd, back with, um, you know, with an author talking about their book. Um, Katie, I wonder if you as a bookseller would talk a little bit about in-person events. It's just always been one of my favorite things about independent bookstores is just like dropping in for an in-person event, even if I don't know the author, I don't know the book, because inevitably something interesting or sort of unexpected is going to be said or is going to happen. I'm going to discover new people. I'm going to discover new books. It's like, it's just such a great vibe at these events. And I, I wonder if you would say something about it. And, and if in your mind, there is an in-person event that you have been involved with that stands out to you as particularly special or strange or <laughs> unexpected or funny. <laughs> you know, sure are. <laughs> I mean, feel free to like to regale us. Yes. Um, that in-person experience is really what has drawn me to Buttonwood and, and just the independent bookstore environment in particular. Um, and, and particularly when independent bookstores will partner with local spaces like public libraries or other entities. But in terms of our store, most recently we had Brian Lee's in for um, our 33rd birthday celebration. And um, there was wonderful um, live demonstration of, of illustrating. And to watch people come in, many, many people, I mean, we had scores of people come through because they knew of the event. But then those folks who dropped in and saw parents, grandparents, children, teens gathered around someone drawing a wombat on an easel and talking about that, and giving tips about how to draw. draw. Um, that was just really a wonderful, wonderful experience because they were laughing. There was humor. 
And then some of my favorite in person events would be when there might be two or three authors and there might be um, an adult mystery author, children's author, young adult author. And watching those authors come to learn about each other and relax and, and take uh, note of another author's writing experience. That's really fun to see in, in those in-person events because it's just so real. It's spontaneous. Um, and I can't really think of anything offhand where something, you know, it, it to me, there's always been going back to Lynn's point, that sharing of story that humanizes us. And you you just see that happening. They Authors can laugh at themselves and they take questions and they love hearing how the readers discover something in a character that they didn't even realize. I'm speaking in very general terms, but, but that often happens, I think, Lynn, right? You, you notice that um, about the reader's experience of, of your own work. Um, definitely. Yeah, it's. Yeah. Definitely. I, I think it's great when readers give you insight into what's between the lines, right? Mm -hmm. And I also think it when you're writing about topics like this, when you're writing about family, when you're talking about writing about trauma, I think that there are times when a reader, and you can tell me if you agree with this, Lynn when a reader will sort of let you know um, um, how, the, how the work has affected them or how they've connected with it at a personal level that, I mean, I find it can be, just be really, really moving and rewarding. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, when we, whenever we hear from readers where they're vulnerable to us and say how a piece moved them, I don't think there's anything better for a writer than to know that you've had that connection across time and space with someone who felt seen or known by what you did. I, I think there's nothing more powerful than that moment. Um, I think when people read my work and then have a conversation and they get upset about a character or they get angry at a character, uh, I'm really welcoming of that because I feel like whatever that emotion is, you know, even if they really don't like a character or they said, she made me so mad, I think to myself, yes, but now you're feeling something. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I didn't set out to make it, you feel like it's all, you know, hearts and flowers. I set out to have you think and feel and inhabit the work. And if that means you're a little angry or upset at the character, well, then I did my job. <laughs> well, you know, you. I mean, you're, yeah, I mean, you're not all, all hearts and flowers. And that was actually something I wanted to ask you about. Um, we have, you know, many of the people who watch this program are themselves authors or are aspiring authors are thinking a lot about, you know, like the publishing industry, about the nuts and bolts, you know, getting an agent, getting a book deal, you know, uh, um, publicity, things like that. So a um, couple questions in that regard. First, an audience question from Trisha um, about what uh, you think has been your biggest challenge on the road to becoming a published author? What do you think? Well, thanks for the question, uh, Trisha. I think it's, you've got to have staying power. I, I I feel like you have to believe in yourself and I don't think that's a, a trite thing to say. It's, it's very difficult to believe in yourself and to persevere. Uh, to know that the industry is ever changing, but what you want to provide may not be in vogue or it might take a longer period of time to find an audience. So it's that perseverance that I think is the absolute hardest thing. Writing when there are no guarantees that you'll be published. Uh, writing when no one seems particularly interested in what you've set out to do, but you need to find a way to make them see it and know it. And Dark Rivers to Cross was such a book because it is, it is quite a, a dark subject matter. And I needed to find a way to have people have Katie's experience, which is, this is hard and I'm going to keep going. And yeah. that's, you know, that was a lot of work. That was a lot of work to have people say, this is hard and I'm still going to keep reading. Uh, so I would say persevere and, and believe in yourself. And the only way I think you can believe in yourself as a writer is to keep writing and to find writer friends. Because yes. when you find writer friends, they're going to tell you they struggle with the exact same things and you will no longer feel 
like it's only you <laughs> that's feeling adrift, right? So finding your people, I think, is another another good piece of advice. That's great advice. You know, I want to ask you, Alina, I'm going to come to you first on this, then then over to you, Katie, about writing about sort of difficult topics, you know, because you bring that up. Um, you know, my my first published novel dealt with um, dealt with the aftermath of a school shooting, uh, you know, of, of a shooting in an elementary school. And what I remember when I was, you know, talking to people about that book, when I was sort of out, you know, doing events for that book and things like that, was it was there? I, I always had the sense that there were times when people just did not want to engage with that when it was just you know in some way it was too much or there were people who, who weren't ready for it or it was just a, a very difficult thing to kind of put out there on the table for people. And I mean, you're writing about difficult topics. You're writing about I, mean, I don't want to say sort of too much in terms of right. giving away things in the book, but I mean, you're you're writing about sort of traumatic and difficult things. And I mean, just to put this in concrete terms. Have you found that it has been difficult when dealing with, you know, agents, editors, booksellers, you know, as we're trying to put this thing out into the world? Is that a challenge to people just sometimes kind of be like, eh, you know, it's a bit much? I have not had that experience with these two books, but let me just say this. I'm I'm incredibly surprised by that because that's what I had expected. Yeah. I had expected when I wrote The Dangers of an Ordinary Night and it's about addiction that I would get that experience that you did. And by the way, I loved your book. I thought you did a very thoughtful yeah, take on, on the ripple effects years later, which is I think really much more about what your book was examining. Um, and the same with Dark Rivers to Cross. I'm not going after the traumatic event and and going at it and going at it and going at it. I'm, I'm letting the reader know the traumatic events happened but this is what we're going to examine in this story, which is over here. It's a different angle. And, and perhaps I haven't found that with these two books because I chose a different angle on which to look at it, which, mm. is, which is for Dark Rivers to Cross, I'm looking at the angle of what happens if this very difficult thing has happened to you. And because you won't ever share it with your children, you can't ever get as close to your children as you wish you could because you're holding yourself at a remove for the secret sake, but there's a consequence to that, right? Mm, mm. And so I feel like the book allows the reader to say, okay, yes, these heavy things happen, but she's actually gonna take us over here and we're gonna look at it from a different angle. And that's what I intended to do. Yes, yes, oh, that's a great answer, thank you. Um, Katie, what are your thoughts when you're when you're dealing with books that have difficult material that have you know potentially you know sort of dealing with trauma and things like that? Um, what are your thoughts, especially when you find yourself in the role of sort of hand selling, you know, and deciding <laughs> you know who are you going to sell this book to and how are you going to present this book? How how do you handle that? I feel that my empathy kicks in when I'm having those initial conversations with the reader. I, 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 I wouldn't say to someone, oh my gosh, I just read Lynn Reed's book, Dark Rivers to Cross, and I, I think you're going to love it. I wouldn't start the conversation that way. Mm. I would like to know where the person's at in terms of serious themes, family, What's a book you've you've read about family recently, or what story have you heard recently, or are you someone who um, likes to explore family trauma through story, or an unsolved mystery through story, and and get to some kind of a resolution? And do you use humor to follow that path to resolution? Do you like the suspense, um, or do, do you like to have the author really, because Lynn does this great job, we haven't even talked about the way um, the, the boat, the natural terms, the water terms are used um, before each chapter or each section. You know, I would use structure of the novel, of the work, to help me um, match the right book to the right reader. I, I wouldn't want to force a title that deals with trauma upon someone who starts sharing 
because remember, in people will feel comfortable in their neighborhood bookstore and they may start sharing stories. And um, I wouldn't want to leap to a conclusion that this is the book for you right now. I tend to give a couple of choices and um, put those books in the hands of the reader and step away a little bit and give that reader a chance to look through the book. Um, I don't know, Lynn, if that would be a good way to handle some of these talks. I think it's a, one, I think it's a thoughtful way. It's a very thoughtful way to say, I'm thinking this might be for you and this is how you might get into that book. Um, I think that that's really, I think that's lovely. And again, I think it goes back to why I love Buttonwood so much because you don't just go in there and somebody's giving you a bunch of books. There's a connection being made. There is a, it's, you're in for the long haul getting to know your readers so that you can keep gradually bringing them along to maybe push their interests to sometimes over time as they become more comfortable. They might read something and come back and say, I didn't think I was gonna like going this deep, but I did, what else do you have, you know? And, and that's really, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a wonderful answer. I mean, it's sort of, I don't think any other bookseller has framed it quite that way. Sort of, his hand selling is an act of empathy yes. with the uh, with the readers. That's 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 wonderful. Um, se segue. Uh, speaking of uh, selling book and speaking of loving Buttonwood, um, we want to encourage the audience to head over to Buttonwood online, pick up a copy of Dark Rivers to Cross, and also. Guys, we're at the part of the program where we're going to sell some books. We're going to go to Katie first as the professional among us, <laughs> and then we'll go to Lynn next. <clears throat> Katie, tell us, tell the audience, um, what are you reading right now that you're, other than Dark Rivers to Cross, what are you reading right now that you are excited about, that is fresh, that you want people to pick up? Well, I, it's interesting. Um, I became my own reader's advisor when I was browsing the nonfiction section of Buttonwood recently. I like to challenge myself sometimes to pick up a book that I might not ordinarily read. And um, I did pick up that book, Hold the Line by Michael Falcone, the, yep. um, yeah, the Washington DC cop detective who reported to the Capitol for duty on his own the day of January 6th because of the calls for help he heard over his radio. And as I read that book, again, it was a difficult read because he brings you to his place in his own life. Um, and he's very gritty, he's very authentic, his voice is very authentic. And I thought, I want, my Buttonwood readers to know this is on the shelf. And I want them to understand that if they pick it up, I, I want them to take a look at it and understand that it's going to bring them to a place that they might want to know about. Yeah. And I'll just no matter again. where you no matter where you stand, they yes. may want to know what was it like that day? And here's a book that's going to tell you. So I read it, wrote up the little review card, and those copies have sold. <laughs> so I guess, you know, that's, you know, that that was a good thing. Um, the other, uh, I'm, I'm just starting the Paris Bookseller book. Um, oh, and that's behind me on the shelf. I don't, oh no, here it is. Paris Bookseller by Carrie Mayer. Yes. Um, and it's about, uh, it's a work of historical fiction that takes you to Sylvia Beach's um, bookstore, Shakespeare and Company. And I I've, I've been thinking about how important our community bookstores are, where we're, where we're craving that space to just have a conversation and not be judged. And Shakespeare and Company, what a bookstore in the yeah. lives authors and readers and political times. So I'm, I've am i just started it and I'm really looking forward to it because I, I think we can just um, relate now to the importance of bookstores in our lives. We didn't think that would be the case, but there it is. Um, and I have one more, Joe. It, they're yeah. kind of, uh, it's interesting. This is another nonfiction, but Tracy Kidder, 
who wrote the book about Dr. Paul Farmer, Mountains Beyond Mountains. Yeah. He's got a new book out coming out called Rough Sleepers. It will hit, um, I, I think it's not even out just yet, but it is what I've been reading. And it talks about the work of um, the mobile medical van of um, Dr. James O'Connell around Boston, um, serving our um, homeless folks and the rough sleepers are those, that's that term for um, the homeless folks. And this is just a great um, book that again, puts you in an uncomfortable experience, but so rich in humanity and, and just, you know, we all experience same feelings, same thoughts, same needs. Um, I don't know how many more you want me to give, but those were there great. Are uh, those, are, those are great recommendations. Note to the audience, you can pick up or pre-order any of those books in the links in the chat from Buttonwood. Uh, we had Carrie Mayer on the program, I believe, last year. We've dropped a link in the chat to that conversation. And for people who are interested, Michael Falcone with Hold the Line is going to be on Mighty Blaze next week. He's going to be on on Tuesday with Mark Cecil on uh, Thoughtful Bro on Tuesday afternoon. So... Uh, mm -hmm. Very exciting book. Those are great. I had no idea, Joe. <laughs> you just teed it up for me. You just teed it up. Um, Lynn, what about you? What are you excited about these days? So I will tell you that I read the recent Louise Erdrich book, The Sentence, which is also set in an independence bookstore. One of the really funny little things that she does is she actually is a character in the book mm -hmm. as the bookseller. So it's a little, it's a little sweet that she's her own bookseller inside her own book. Uh, but that book also deals with darker themes. It takes place during, in the aftermath of, of the George Floyd incident in his, in his death. And it also looks at what was happening during the pandemic. Uh, the major character in the story has recently uh, uh, gotten out of jail. So it looks at criminal justice and political science. And of course it's Louise Erdrich, so it's wrapped in a brilliant story and the writing is gorgeous. The sentence, it's just wonderful. And then another one that I think is terrific because it also does a beautiful job with landscape. Uh, my novel, Dark Rivers to Cross, is at the top of the Appalachian Trail, which is Baxter State Park. But this novel, Flight Risk by Joy Castro, takes place in West Virginia on the Appalachian Trail. And it's a woman who's trying to contend with the life that she's created now and the life that she lived as a child and the discrepancy between the life that was and the life that she tried to create. It's also a mystery. So you get you get sort of the best of all of those pieces. Those are great recommendations. We're putting all of those into the chat. Thank you both so much. Um, this time has just flown by. Um, Katie, we always go to the bookseller with the last question of the program. So I'm going to bring it to you. And, uh, and it is a fill in the blank. It goes like this. Uh, success as an independent bookseller is part luck, part hard work, and part what else? Relishing independence. Okay. That's a great answer. I love it. I love it. And not everybody does. Not everybody does. But I think that's a, that's a fabulous answer. Thank you so much. That's great. It's been such a pleasure to speak to both of you. Um, I want to remind the audience, pick up a copy of Dark Rivers to Cross from Buttonwood, or if you can, head on over tomorrow night to see Lynn in person yes, in conversation. Please, do. please come. With Marjan Kamali. That's going to be great. Uh, we are continuing our quest uh, to interview booksellers from all 50 states, plus Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia. We are so close. Uh, we only have a few more to go. Um, we are still looking for Hawaii, Indiana, Louisiana, Maryland, and Nebraska. If you have a beloved independent bookseller in any of those states, get in touch and let us know. Um, we will be back here next week, same time, same place with Authors Love Bookstores. Thank you both. Uh, thank you to our audience, and until we see you again, be well and keep reading. <laughs>